right. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you all are with us for Bible class this morning. Um, you can see that things are a little bit different in here this morning. We just had vacation Bible school yesterday, and um, we did this last year, too. We like the idea of keeping up some of what was made for VBS for everyone to see on, uh, on the next day. And so right here, these are the walls of Jericho that uh, very dramatically came tumbling down uh, yesterday, and then we rebuilt them for you all to see this morning, and there's other things around the auditorium and out in the lobby and, uh, and things like that to see. Uh, but it was a great day yesterday, um, and I think uh, all the children that were here were, uh, I think they had a fun time, and uh, we hope that, that they also walked away learning a little bit more about God than they did before they came. Uh, I don't know the total number of children. I know the total number of children plus uh, adults who were present for class plus everyone who was involved in making the day happen was 64. Um, but I, I don't know how it divides up, but that was the total count. All right, so uh, let's begin with a word of prayer uh, this morning. Uh, do we have any prayer requests or prayers of thanksgiving and praise that we want to mention? Barbara. Barbara. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Great. That is great. Uh -huh. That's definitely something to rejoice and give thanks for. Doris. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We will be lifting them up in prayer with the devastation that they've been facing. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Joe. My sister Beth and my cousin's dad, Dwight, is down here. Okay. We'll pray for your sister and we'll pray for your cousin. Anyone else? Okay, well, if that's, um, if that's everyone, then uh, bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this first day of the week. We come together in the day that your son conquered the grave, and we uh, remember him, we worship him, we worship you, and we open up your word, we see one another and are encouraged, and we ask that you'll bless this time. Uh, bless us specifically over the next hour or so as we look into the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we pray that our hearts and minds will be uh, open and that we will be better in, instructed about you and challenged to live faithfully for you. Lord, we want to uh, say thank you for all of our blessings. You pour out so many gifts, so many wonderful blessings upon our heads every day, and sometimes we take them for granted, but we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us, and they vary from person to person, and uh, you equip us in different ways to serve you, and we're so grateful, and we ask that the way in which we use the resources you've given us will demonstrate our gratitude and bring glory to you. Father, we have a few prayer requests that we want to mention this morning. One prayer of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for Josiah Kalish and his decision to commit his life to you. We thank you that when, um, when, when someone who turns to you in faith and repentance and is washed clean, we, we thank you that they are truly washed clean, that they are empowered for a new life and that they are incorporated into a new family. We ask that you'll bless Josiah and in, in his walk of faith um, that, that is just now beginning for him. Lord, we also want to lift up um, all those affected by the devastation in eastern Kentucky with the terrible flooding. Uh, those who have lost loved ones, we ask that you surround them and comfort them. Those who have lost homes, those who have lost other things as well, and, and who suddenly are looking at a very uncertain future, and uh, are also filled with present grief and shock. Please surround them and bless them. Uh, we pray for all the various relief efforts that will be going on, and we ask that they will be effective, and uh, we ask that you will bless the situation there. And, and Father, for that matter, we know also of other crises around the world. Uh, we think continually of the war in Ukraine and, and other situations, and we lift up everyone involved, and, and we ask your blessings on these horrible circumstances. Father, we also want to lift up uh, Joe's sister who fell, we ask that you bless her to recover in a timely manner, and we also want to lift up her cousin who has bladder cancer. Bless uh, the treatment of that cancer. We pray that it can be healed and that you will be with her cousin. 
Again, Lord, bless us uh, this time in the Gospel of Luke as we consider Jesus' identity and mission and what those things tell us about imitating him uh, in the present day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> well, um, we have been, for quite a while now, longer than I in, in, intended for us, uh, we have been in the first stage of Jesus' ministry uh, in the Gospel of Luke, and that occurs mainly in the region of Galilee, and we've taken a thematic approach to this. We've talked about how he brings salvation, the opposition to salvation that he encounters. We've talked about how he calls and teaches disciples. And last week, we started wrapping up the first stage of Jesus' ministry by looking at uh, two moments in it that prepare us for the second stage, prepare us for what we're about to begin looking at. Um, and <clears throat> I'd like us to finish looking at those moments uh, this morning so that next week, uh, we'll be ready to begin the second stage of Jesus' ministry, which in a number of ways is quite a bit different than the first that we've been uh, looking at. And these moments that, that we'll look at this morning, they are key moments in Luke uh, that tell us some very important things about Jesus' identity, tell us about what he's doing, his mission. And so as followers of Jesus today, as his disciples today, uh, these moments are really important if we want to follow him uh, because his identity and mission in a lot of ways needs to be our identity and mission. So learning about these things can be really helpful for us. Um, and also these moments will tell us a little bit about how people respond uh, to Jesus. People respond negatively and positively to Jesus. Of course, those who are drawn to Jesus and become his followers are certainly responding positively to him, but others do not respond uh, so positively. And so uh, their response to Jesus is important for helping us understand his life and also his death. Uh, that Luke is already beginning to build up towards. Uh, and it, it helps us also understand the, the world's response to followers of Jesus today. So um, th those are some of the things we'll be focusing on as we get into these moments. Uh, last week, we focused on a moment from Luke chapter 7. Um, let's see. If I, yeah, last week we focused on a moment from Luke chapter 7. Uh, we read John the Baptist express some uncertainty, uh, and he was expressing it from prison by sending messengers, express some uncertainty about whether or not Jesus really is the one who is to come, whether or not he really is God's appointed one, uh, the Messiah, these kinds of things. And, and we mentioned, as we looked at that, that was in Luke chapter 7, we mentioned that a main reason John is likely having some doubt is because Jesus is performing a different kind of ministry, at least on the surface, a different kind of ministry than John probably expected Jesus to be performing. And so Jesus... Um, sends John's messengers back with an affirmation that, yes, he is the one who is to come. He is doing exactly what Scripture says uh, he should be doing. And John will be blessed if instead of rejecting Jesus and taking offense at him because he's not what he expected, he will be blessed if he embraces what Jesus is doing instead. And then Jesus goes on to talk to the crowds who were present for this moment um, he goes on to talk to them about the importance of John the Baptist's ministry and how his ministry fulfills Scripture. Uh, but he makes sure, even as he does that, to emphasize that um, <clears throat> glory and honor is not bestowed on someone just for being important in that way. Not in the kingdom of God. That might be the way the world works, but in the kingdom of God, it's different. The kingdom of God bestows honor uh, instead on the least in the kingdom. And so Jesus clearly signals that um, the kingdom of God operates on a very different set of values than the world's values. And then, uh, as we drew near to, to the end of where we were last week, we read that the people, uh, including the tax collectors, they rejoiced at what Jesus was saying about John because they had embraced John's message. They had been baptized by John, while the Pharisees and the other religious leaders had rejected John. And therefore, Luke tells us, they rejected the purpose of God for themselves. Um, so that is where we got last week, and this last statement here about um, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the purpose of God, that sets the stage for what Jesus uh, says next. Uh, and, and this is where we'll get into some new material. This is Luke 7, 31 through 35. I just realized, I don't think I have the microphone ready. Um, give me just a second. Yeah, I forgot to put the batteries in. Give me one moment, I'm sorry. While I'm putting them in, would someone like to read these, these verses for us? 
Okay, I'll get you the microphone in just a second here. Go ahead and read, Barbara, and I think I put the batteries in wrong. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played flute for a year, and we did not dance. We sold herbs, and we did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him. A glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. All right, so here we see Jesus um, comparing and contrasting himself with John. And as he does this, he tells us something about how people respond, not just to Jesus or not just to John, but ultimately how they respond to God. We just read in the verse prior to this, the Pharisees rejected the purpose of God for themselves. And Jesus is elaborating this sum. And so that's why I entitled this section, Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, uh, because it pretty much sums up the perspective of the Pharisees and others uh, who Jesus is criticizing as he criticizes the people of this generation, um, he says. Um, <clears throat> and so Jesus says that his generation is like children who play different kinds of music. Uh, but as they do that, they don't get the appropriate kinds of responses for that kind of music. So uh, playing a tune on the flute, a fun, upbeat tune, that ought to motivate children to dance, but it doesn't. Or if they're playing a really sad uh, tune, a dirge is what this translation calls it, which is a song fit for like a funeral setting, um, that ought to bring about weeping, but it doesn't do that either. And so no matter what the children do, uh, their fellow children will not respond appropriately. And so Jesus says that in the same way, John the Baptist's ministry did not involve eating bread and drinking wine. Uh, in other words, he wasn't attending uh, banquets and dinners. He wasn't going to weddings and other kinds of festive occasions. John the Baptist was not like that at all. He was out in the wilderness. Um, he was eating locusts and wild honey. He was clothed in camel's hair, preaching this fiery message. He was, well, if, if you were at VBS yesterday and you saw the way I looked as Joshua, that's kind of how John the Baptist probably looked. Um, and what did they say about him? They said he's demon-possessed. He's crazy. Uh, he's inhabited by a, a, a worker for the spiritual forces of darkness. He has a demon. Well, Jesus comes, the Son of Man comes, and he does the exact opposite of John. Um, he does attend banquets and dinners and celebrations. Um, we've read in, G in Luke of Jesus sharing meals already. That's something we've read earlier uh, in the Gospel of John, we might think of him going to the wedding in Cana of Galilee. But the point is, Jesus is engaging in the social life of his culture. He's engaging in the social life of his culture, unlike John. He's taking a very different approach to ministry than John. And what do they say about Jesus? Glutton, drunkard, friend of tax collectors, sinners. Yeah, so the people of Jesus' generation cannot be pleased uh, no matter what. There is always a criticism to be found for what God is doing, whether it's how God is acting through John or how God is acting through Jesus. And so for, in the critic's mind, there's always some justification for their point of view, no matter what. And I think we have all encountered this, this phenomenon in other settings. Um, we've all probably seen politicians treated this way, where their political opponents will criticize them, and it doesn't matter what they do. There is always an angle to criticize uh, one's political opponents. Or maybe you've experienced others, uh, whether they're non-Christians looking for, at, from the outside in or Christians, maybe you've experienced people criticize the church this way, criticize a church, a local church, or criticize the church worldwide, where no matter what they do, there's always some flaw that you can really point out and, and harp on. it. And the point is here, Jesus recognizes that not everyone is going to be receptive to how God acts in the world, no matter how he acts uh, in the world. And, and it's important to remember, he's not just saying this to anyone. Jesus is speaking to his fellow Jews. He's speaking to God's chosen people as he says this. Uh, so that reminds us, even among the people of God, 
even among the people of God, not everyone is actually open to uh, God's will for their lives and, and God's will for the world. And that means rejection. That means um, Jesus will face rejection. That means his followers will face rejection. And, and Jesus is already facing some of this. And, of course, later in Luke he'll face the ultimate expression of, of rejection. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first moment I want us to look at. Again, we're really wrapping up a moment from last week. Before we move on to a second moment uh, that will prepare us for the next stage of Jesus' ministry, uh, this is a good space to, to pause. Any questions or reflections on what we've read Jesus say here? Okay. <clears throat> well, um, let's move on to the second moment now uh, from Luke. This is a couple chapters later in, in Luke chapter 9. Um, this second moment is actually part of the, the final series of events in the first stage of Jesus' ministry. Luke 9 is kind of the cutoff where the first stage ends and the second stage begins. Um, and Jesus here, he says some things and he also experiences some things that are crucial for helping his disciples understand who he really is versus who they expected him uh, to be. Uh, and as he says those things, he, he challenges us directly, not just implicitly, but directly challenges us with a call to be like him and to imitate him. And so what Jesus says and experiences in Luke 9 will, will set the tone for a lot of his teachings and a lot of his parables that will come in the second section of, uh, of Luke. So the two key parts that make up this final series of events in Luke 9, uh, the first part is Jesus Asking, who his, asking his disciples uh, who they think he really is. And the second is a moment where uh, God actually directly tells Jesus, with some of his disciples present, he directly tells Jesus uh, who he really is. So the identity of Jesus uh, is a major concern at, at the close of this first stage of, of his ministry. And as we think about the identity of Jesus, as, as the text think, works through the identity of Jesus, uh, that gives questions, uh, that gives way to questions about his mission. All right? Who is he and what is he doing? His identity and his mission. And those concerns then give way to, all right, well, what should his followers be doing? And so all that comes out here in, in uh, Luke chapter 9. I do want to begin here, though, with a passage that we've actually already looked at um, in this class. This is uh, verses 7 through 9, where we read about um, Herod who hears reports of Jesus and who people are saying Jesus is. So right here, we already see they're trying to identify him. Identity is, is important. And we read here that some are saying that he is John the Baptist, back from the dead. Um, he's, John the Baptist has been executed by this point. Uh, some say that he's Elijah uh, from the Old Testament. Some say that he's some other prophet from the Old Testament. And Herod really just doesn't know what to make of it all. And so he asks a question about Jesus' identity. He says, who is this about whom I hear uh, such things? Well, just a few verses later, uh, we get another question about Jesus' identity. And this time, Jesus himself um, asks the question. Um, I'll just read this because it's short. Verses 18 through 20. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? There's the identity question. And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. So Jesus asks, all right, well, who do the crowds say that I am? And notice that the options for who Jesus is, they're the same options that Herod was aware of just a few verses earlier. He could be John the Baptist. He could be Elijah. He could be some other prophet uh, from, from the ancient past. And so then Jesus says in verse 20, all right, well, how about you? Uh, you know, you're my disciples. You follow me and listen to me more than anyone else. Uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. You are the Christ of God. So Peter, right here in this moment, he now recognizes what we as, as readers of Luke, if we were just reading it like in one sitting or something, what we as readers of Luke have, been, have known to be true since Jesus was born. Uh, when Jesus was born and his, his birth was being announced, uh, the angels told the shepherds, 
that uh, Jesus is Christ the Lord. So as readers of Luke, we've known this for a while, and Peter is, is now accurately realizing who Jesus is. And Peter is probably not speaking alone. He's probably speaking on behalf of the group. So Jesus' disciples as a whole, it seems, have come to realize as they've witnessed his miracles, as, the, as they've listened to his teachings, they've seen his way of life, and they've come to realize they are dealing with God's anointed one. That's what Christ or Messiah means, God's uh, anointed one. So this all sounds really good, um, but what Jesus says next definitely would have confused and, and surprised uh, some people. Um, would anyone like to read verses 21 and 22? Doris, thank you. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to, to no one saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. All right. So this part probably would have come as quite a shock to Jesus' disciples. Right after they identify he's God's anointed one, he's the Christ of God. Um, to Jews living in Jesus' time, um, thinking about the Christ, thinking about the Messiah, this would have conjured up images of restoring the glory of Israel, of defeating the Romans, uh, putting a king back on David's throne, all these kinds of things. But then Jesus begins to say here, that's not the kind of Messiah that he is. He's not that kind of Messiah. Instead, he's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected. So here's, there's our rejection theme again that we saw in, in Luke 7 when we were talking about John the Baptist. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be killed. And on the third day, uh, he's going to rise again. Jews in, in this time had various beliefs about the Messiah. It wasn't that there was just one idea that they, that they all held on to. There were different ideas about the Messiah. But none of them thought that this is what would happen uh, to the Messiah. This is so different uh, from their expectations that it would have been really hard for them to understand what Jesus is saying. Uh, and Luke tells us in just a little bit, we'll read just how confused they were. Um, so maybe to just help us put our minds in the Jews, in the, the disciples' place and appreciate how confusing this would have been, I'm just going to use an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, um, and it's an analogy involving the president, which I know because no matter who's in office at any given time, half the country is, at least is really unhappy. So I know it's an imperfect analogy, but don't picture a particular president, just think of a generic president of the United States, say you get a message that uh, the president is going to come to your hometown and come to your house. Uh, and, and, okay, that's probably extremely overwhelming. Already you're probably very confused. Like, who am I that he's coming to my house? Um, and you, I would imagine if we got that news, we'd think, all right, we really got to roll out the carpet for the leader of the free world. You know, we've got to really make this house nice. We've got to probably alert all the neighbors. We've got to have a splendid meal. We've got to have bedding for him and all his secret service agents. I mean, this has to be, we have to really roll out the red carpet for the president of the United States. And then you're told, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. He's actually going to come to your house by himself, and he's going to do your grocery shopping for you, and he's going to, like, pick up your kids from school if your kids are in school, um, and he's going to do your dishes for you. And then um, he's, he's not even going to, like, get on Air Force One or, or motorcade. He's just going to hitch a ride back to D.C., you know, he'll, or maybe he'll get a Greyhound bus or something. He'll, he'll make it back just fine. Um, if we were told that, we would be so surprised and shocked that we would think, all right, this is a trick or there is some kind of horrible mistake. You know, this is just not at all what would be on anyone's radar. And thinking about God's anointed one being rejected and suffering and dying um, instead of sitting on David's throne and, and restoring the glory of Israel, I think thinking about it that way can help us appreciate how, how the disciples were so confused by this. Because we hear this today, knowing the full story of the gospel, and it's not confusing. Like, okay, this is what's going to happen to Jesus. But it would have been quite confusing to many Jews hearing what Jesus uh, is saying. <clears throat> so uh, now that Jesus has been identified as the Christ, um, and has said something about what the Christ does, what kind of Christ he is, 
he's now ready to call his disciples to imitate him and be like him. So let's read verses 23 through 27. Uh, would someone be willing to read these verses for us? Doris, you, you like to read again? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Okay. So now that we've read that um, not only is the Messiah going to be rejected and die uh, and then rise again, but not only have we, have we read that, but now his followers must daily deny themselves and walk the same path. And he says, the, the language he uses, he says, they must take up the cross daily and follow him. Uh, it's really hard to overstate, I think, the power of that imagery, taking up the cross daily uh, and following him. The cross in Jesus' time is a symbol of death, uh, a symbol of rejection, a symbol of shame. Uh, we've talked before in here about the honor-shame culture in which Jesus lived. There's really no more humiliating and terrible way to die uh, in Jesus' time than the cross. And for Jesus, it's also, it's not just a symbol of death, rejection, shame. It's also a symbol of sacrifice uh, because Jesus is going to take up the cross willingly. Uh, and that's very powerful to think about. And Jesus says that following him means daily taking up the cross, daily facing that same kind of rejection that Jesus is going to face uh, and, and realizing that, embracing that, and following him uh, anyway. And this would not have been what Jews would have expected if they ever thought of something like following the Messiah. Uh, they would have thought of following the Messiah maybe into battle uh, or following the Messiah, uh, definitely not just into battle, but into victory. Uh, they would have thought of maybe following him as the whole nation kept God's law and the Messiah perhaps helped make that happen, helped them keep it faithfully. Following him as the glory of Israel was was reestablished, and Jesus instead says that we follow him by emptying ourselves, just like he is going to empty uh, himself. And he, uh, he expounds on this some in verses 24 through 26. He says that when we give up our lives in this way, we actually find our lives. Uh, but when we try to hold on to life for ourselves, if we try to do that, we end up losing it. And I think we all know this uh, by living the Christian life for, for a while, we all know this to be true at a uh, psychological and at a spiritual level. Uh, surrendering to God, surrendering our lives to God is where the greatest joy and fulfillment uh, can be found. And it will also be true in a, I don't want to say a more literal way, but it will be true in another sense um, when Jesus returns. There is coming a day, and Jesus mentions it here, um, <clears throat> there's, a com there's coming a day where he will come in glory, that's a little bit more like what the Jews were expecting the Messiah to, to come like the first time. There's a day coming where he will come um, in glory, and he will be ashamed on that day of whoever has been ashamed of him, and whoever has been ashamed of the, the path of the cross that, that he has taken. Uh, and, and if they're ashamed of that, then obviously they haven't taken up the cross uh, and followed him. And again, this is big for Jesus to say, whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed. Um, this is big because, again, the cross is a symbol of shame. And that means many people will be ashamed of Jesus. Many people will not want to take up the cross daily uh, and follow him. And many still are ashamed of Jesus today, but, but perhaps for different reasons. But they are also ashamed. And Jesus says that if we are not ashamed, if we instead embrace the cross, just like Jesus told John, if, you don't, if you're not offended by me, but embrace what I'm doing, if we're not ashamed and embrace the cross, then we will find our lives uh, rather than lose them uh, when he returns. So at this point in Luke chapter 9, uh, Jesus has been identified 
He's the Christ. Uh, his mission has been stated. He's going to suffer and die and be rejected and rise again. And his disciples are called to follow him uh, in walking that same path of rejection that will lead um, to victory. And so I'd like us to just try to, to take a moment um, and put ourselves in the disciples, put ourselves in the apostles' shoes, and consider how hard verses 23 through 27 uh, may be to hear. Consider how hard it may be to hear this for the first time. Um, their Messiah is not at all what they were expecting and hoping him to be. And if they want to share in the coming glory and the coming good things to come that, that they as a people have been looking forward to for a while, um, they have to follow uh, an unexpected path, uh, a path of shame and rejection and suffering. And so this would have been a time, hearing these words from Jesus, this would have been a time when it would be very easy to second-guess things and perhaps be discouraged at what Jesus is saying, and definitely a time to, where it would be very easy to feel very confused. Uh, and Matthew and Mark's account of this, it's not in Luke's account, but it still helps us appreciate how disorienting this would have been. Matthew and Mark's account tell us of, Je of Peter at this point pulling Jesus aside and saying, this stuff is not going to happen to you, and Jesus has to rebuke him. Uh, in that moment. And so that, again, can help us appreciate how difficult this would be uh, for the disciples to hear. Um, and so all of that and the confusion and maybe discouragement that would come along with it, um, that, helps, um, that helps make what is going to happen next that we're about to read even more important uh, and significant. But before we move on to what we're going to read next, um, let me pause here. Any questions or comments on Anything that Jesus has said about himself and what he's going to do and what followers of Jesus need to be doing. Uh, Barb, if you could pass the microphone up. I was just wondering, doesn't Isaiah speak of the coming Messiah and doesn't it mention the three days and doesn't it mention hanging on a tree and and being persecuted and such. So if that's true, if the prophets prophesied this happening, wouldn't they, who are familiar with the, uh, the Old Testament, have some inkling of this um, future for mm. Jesus and mm. not be so surprised mm. by it, but actually start seeing more clearly mm. what um, his purpose is? Yeah, that's a great... Great question, great observation. And actually, in our sermon today, we'll be speaking about some of those passages from Isaiah. Um, so, yeah, Isaiah talks about this servant of the Lord, and as he does various things in Isaiah, but part of what he does is he suffers and dies for the transgressions of Israel. Um, and then in Deuteronomy, it talks about cursed is the one who hangs on a tree, and, and there are other passages as well. Um, so those scriptures are there. And, and so there, there is reason to think that maybe some Jews would, would have worked some of these things out. But those passages, if, if we don't have the New Testament to, to read them alongside, they, they can be pretty obscure. And who they, the identity of the servant even is in Isaiah um, is, is actually a, a subject of ongoing debate. Christians, of course, see it as Jesus. But when trying to put ourselves in Isaiah's shoes and think, all right, who would, who would the average Israelite or average Jew think this person is? It's really not super clear um, without Jesus coming exactly who this servant is and what he's going to be doing. And on top of that, um, as I talk about what Jews were thinking in Jesus' time, um, the prophets were wrote you know, many, many years before. And how Jews in Jesus' time understood the prophets is best understood by literature that has survived from around the time of Jesus uh, that Jews wrote. And we can see that in things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and in other books that have survived. And when they reference a Messiah, those texts that are closer to the time of Jesus, they don't, they don't really speak of the Messiah coming and sacrificing himself and dying and rising again. They speak of sitting on David's throne. They speak of him sometimes being a priest, uh, restoring the glory. So even though those things are, are in the text of Isaiah, um, it doesn't appear that Jews in Jesus' time had seized on them as the main things that were in their mind of what the Messiah would be doing. So that, that's where I was coming from when I was saying I don't, I don't think anyone would have really expected this. This would have been quite a shock. Any other thoughts on what Jesus has said 
um, or, or anything like that before we move on. Okay, um, we've got a few minutes. We may not finish what's coming next, and that's okay if we don't. Um, <clears throat> but this next moment uh, in this final series of events um, of, Je of the first stage of Jesus' ministry, it also is concerned with Jesus' identity. Uh, but here, God himself directly tells Jesus and directly tells some of his followers uh, who he is. And this is the really powerful moment of Jesus' transfiguration. Uh, this is actually the second time we read in Luke of God stepping into Luke's account as a heavenly voice to make a declaration about Jesus. Anyone recall what the first time was? We read it earlier in Luke. Jesus' baptism. baptism. Uh, we have a heavenly voice coming down speaking about Jesus then. Uh, we have it again here. Um, Ron, would you be willing to read for us verses 28 through 31? Thank you. Now, about eight days later, after these say uh, sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became diz dazzling white. And, be and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. All right, thank you. So a little over a week later, and Luke directly connects this event with what Jesus had been saying to the disciples. A little over a week later, after all of that, uh, Jesus takes three apostles, uh, Peter, James, and John, and he goes up on a mountain uh, to pray. And an amazing thing happens while Jesus uh, is praying. His face is altered in appearance, his clothes become dazzlingly white, um, and two men appear with him. And not just any two men. Uh, these are two of the largest figures in Israel's uh, history. We have Moses, who led Israel out of slavery, received God's law on Mount Sinai, led them through the wilderness. We have Moses. We have Elijah, one of the most uh, significant prophets from the Old Testament. We have Moses and Elijah. And the two of them are speaking uh, to Jesus, and uh, let's keep reading and, and see what happens next. Ron, would you be okay finishing this out for us, reading verses 32 through 36? Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were uh, parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As, uh, as he was saying these things, the cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. All right. So as this is happening, Peter and James and John, they are actually uh, overcome by sleep during most of this. But they do see Jesus' glory. They do see the two men who were there. Um, and Peter, we, we just read Peter make a request about what to do that may be well-intentioned but isn't actually uh, the best idea. And a heavenly voice, God, um, identifies Jesus here as his son, uh, his chosen one, and the one people should be listening to, the one people should be paying attention to. I want to notice just a couple of things about this really amazing event that will help us, I think, appreciate um, its significance. Um, first, uh, this event has a really deep connection to the past, a deep connection to uh, major events that we read about in the Old Testament. So it, it takes place, first of all, on a mountain where significant things tend to happen in the Bible. Think about Mount Sinai, Mount Carmel, other places. Mountains are key places in the Bible where amazing revelations of, from God tend to happen. Jesus' face is altered. 
just like Moses, when he went up on Mount Sinai, receives God's law, uh, his face was altered when he came down and they had to put a veil over his face so people were, were you know, overwhelmed by, by the brightness of him from having been in, in the presence of, of God's glory. And then, of course, Moses and Elijah appear uh, on the mountain. And notice that they're speaking about Jesus' departure. Um, the word, this, this is significant here, uh, they say they speak of his departure. The word in Greek for departure is the same word um, for exodus. The same word for exodus. So the presence of Moses on a mountain, speaking about an exodus, this would clearly, I think, call to mind Israel coming out from Egypt, coming, crossing through the Red Sea, being delivered uh, from slavery. So this moment has a lot of things that would signal to any, any Jew or any early Christian who really knows the Old Testament well, it would signal, all right, this is a major moment that is a lot like other major moments that I've read in the scriptures uh, before. So it really looks to the past, um, but also it looks ahead to the future. Um, so, hang on, I didn't mean to advance the slides yet. Notice again what they're talking about. They're talking about his departure, his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So it's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. And we, of course, knowing the rest of the story of Jesus, this is referring to uh, his, his death on, on the cross. Um, so here we have all these great moments from Israel's past brought to mind. And, and with those great moments, go with them all the hopes of the great glorious future that the Jews associated as they read those events with what they believed God was going to do among them. And we see that they are going to be fulfilled in a way that Jews and others would not expect. It's going to be fulfilled through Jesus' death um, in Jerusalem. And we see here also, uh, let's see, hang on. Okay, here it is, verse 33. Uh, we see that Peter does not fully understand this. He does not fully grasp this. He, what he wants to do is commemorate the present moment. He wants to build three, three tents. That's actually also the word for tabernacle. He wants to build three tabernacles for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. He wants to commemorate this present moment. He's not really in a position to grasp uh, the significance of this moment for understanding what is going to happen to Jesus in the future, what's going to happen to Jesus uh, on the cross. And because he and the others are not really in a, in a position to understand this, that's why the heavenly voice um, is so important. Jesus is not the kind of Messiah Jews expected. He's not the kind of Savior that we humans generally look for. And that's why it's all the more important that the voice say, this is my son, my chosen one. He's the one you need to be uh, listening to. We need to listen to him. Instead of reject him, instead of dismiss him, we need to listen uh, to him. <clears throat> and um, Luke draws, I, I am having to skip some things, but Luke draws this home even more after this event. Um, <clears throat> he drives this home one more time as we close out this stage of Jesus' ministry. Um, I'll just read this real quick. While they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. All right, he really wants them to pay attention. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed for, from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. So Jesus is really driving home as this stage of Luke closes out. His, well, Luke is really driving home his identity. The heavenly voice is driving home his identity. And Jesus is really driving home what's going to happen to him. And we will see as we move into the next stage of Luke um, next week that as Jesus, the next stage involves Jesus traveling to Jerusalem, basically. We just read about his departure at Jerusalem. The next stage is Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. As he does that, he's teaching about discipleship. He's teaching about how to be like him in parables and things. And we'll see that what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem kind of hangs over all of it, kind of like this ominous cloud. And the, the problem is um, the disciples don't understand that. They don't fully grasp what's going to be happening to Jesus at, once he finally reaches uh, Jerusalem. Um, it's 1046. I think that was the second bell. That was only the first bell? Okay, so we have a couple more minutes. 
Um, I basically got through everything I wanted to get through. So any questions or reflections on anything from this morning before we dismiss? Barbara. That's a great observation. I've been focusing on what this moment means for the disciples and things, uh, but Barbara pointed out well what this would also mean for Jesus. Uh, he's about to go through something unspeakably difficult, and, and we see in later uh, in his ministry, well, later right before his death in the garden, you know, we see how difficult this is for him. And so, certainly, a moment like this, where figures who have been faithful to him, really, since he's gotten the flesh, they've been faithful to him in the past. Um, coming and encouraging him, speaking about what's to come, uh, certainly this would have been a moment that fortified him uh, for the journey to Jerusalem he's about uh, to take. Yeah, that's a great observation. Anyone else? All right, well, we'll be done a couple minutes early. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we'll go ahead and be dismissed, and we'll have worship at 11 o'clock.